last thing of Black Writers Weekend, but this is like the last part of like the sessions, the panels. We have a really dope event happening tomorrow evening, so do not leave. But it's been like a whole weekend, kind of almost coming to a close. First off, how are you just feeling like right now? Oh, for real? I got to be honest. I cannot feel my right leg all day.
from maybe like ages age eight up into about eleven, I recorded myself on cassettes. I was a PK kid, so I would record myself praying a lot of my original songs and all of that, and just talking, reciting poetry and stuff like that. And I knew that one day, growing up, I was going to take those cassettes and I was going to use. I don't know how, but what I did was I took some of those recordings and I made skits in between my podcasts. That way, you get to hear young Mika, and now you get to hear Mika from today. Um, so that's why it's called Traces of Mika, because you're getting all of you know the elements of who I was, who I am now, who I'm trying to become. And um, I, the, the type of conversations that I had, I'm very transparent. It's a memoir. So essentially, you're going to hear some things that are not only true, but somewhat uncomfortable, because I reveal a lot of truths that I did not talk about at all. Like, I was at, like, at the height of my writing career. Like, I was living like a rock star, y'all. And I had, like, 13 boyfriends at one time. I was living in a sister. Like, I was traveling everywhere. I was making hell of money. Like, I was doing the most. And then at the half the time, I would take my children with me to, like, the book, like, trade shows and stuff like that. Because they would hate when I was on the road. But I was also in this marriage that I hated. I got, I, I love you, you family, but I don't want to be with you like that. That was my whole thing. And he fought that every step of the way and he was like the root of a lot of um, trauma that trickled down mm-hmm. and if you listen to my podcast you will you will hear my experiences in that marriage from the, the arguing to um, to the mental abuse to the fighting to his conviction because he was convicted of sexually assaulting another woman while we were married and I and you know how we're black women right and I ain't talking about this and I was like in my writing career at that time, and I'm out doing book signs, I'm talking to people, and I'm smiling, but all it's a lot of bullshit going on mm-hmm. behind the scenes. And what's crazy is, for him, I was supposed to make it all okay. I was the one that was carrying on the burden and making sure that bills were still getting paid. You know, my children never even knew what was going on, because that's what we do, we protect our children. Yes. And so with them being ignorant to everything that was going on, he was able to create his own narrative. And when he created his own narrative, I became the only enemy in my own home with my own children. You broke our family up. You're the reason why this and that. It was, it was bad, y'all. I was, it was, I was living hell in my own home. But if my children were my children, I would have kicked their ass down a long time ago. I didn't do nothing. That's how I felt. But because they were my children, they're young and impressionable. They don't know no better. So I'm taking the punches. I'm taking the hits. My children need to be so manipulative. I had CPS in my house interviewing me on every month. I could have had my children taken away. Mm-hmm. And then when I would tell my, my husband at the time, can you stop these lies? I'm doing this. His response would be, oh, I just want my family back. Mm-hmm. So in other words, you'll stop manipulating lines of our kids if I just let you back in my home. And I stuck to my guns, and I did not let him back in my home, but I also paid the price for that. So I talked about that really deeply on my podcast, and like in real detail, like everything that I went through with my children, not really enjoying mother. I hated being a mom. I did not get to enjoy it at all. And so I think this is also why I fell out of love with writing love stories, because I was beginning to be so broken down. And this is just one trauma that I'm talking I'm talking, I had multiple traumas and things going on back to back, back to back for at least 10 years. And in, in, the, in the, the, the realm of doing all that, I'm doing things like this. And I'm connecting the dots for other writers, and I'm, I'm creating all these great experiences, but when I go home, and I gotta deal with all these things. So this is why I started that podcast, because I want to have this conversation, and I needed to purge so that I can continue to heal and be okay, because I was bitter and I was upset for quite a long time. Because I ain't do nothing. Like, I, I suffered all this, but I didn't, well, granted, I probably did do something, but, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. So, but essentially, that's, that's the core of why I decided to do my memoir podcast, because I wanted to begin to heal, but I also wanted to talk about, and there's a lot of other people that's going through a lot of darkness and pain and, and disappointments. I ain't got no mama, I ain't got no daddy, I ain't even got no siblings I can lean on, I ain't got no grandparents. So when it was time for me to pick up and dust myself off, I had to do it by myself. One of the hardest things I've ever done. Try not to get emotional. Because I root for myself now and I'm proud of myself for the things I've done. But that was nice.
How many of y'all kind of struggle with like just truly being vulnerable in your work? Yeah. Oh, being vulnerable in your work, just truly expressing like how you really are, how you really feel, and not sugarcoating. Because you definitely could have played it safe. You could have created a whole other podcast. Good enough. It was great. It was definitely, it definitely was. Because then in season two, I'll talk about this too, in season two, because my daughter is like very close to her dad. And so even though she sees and knows the truth, it don't matter. Her dad's like her buddy, her best friend. So my daughter was interviewed, and I don't know if you guys were here earlier, Nicole Mitchell, she was on the Say Her Name now. Um, that's my best friend, my, my best friend. Every one of my in my life, that's my, my closest to her. And so my daughter was on a panel. She does a Girls Who Brunch. is a, a, a youth organization for girls who build a self-esteem. And my daughter was on a panel, and they asked my daughter something about how did you discover your self-worth. And my daughter was responding with, well, I had to really discover it by myself because um, something, she said something so distasteful. And I was like, no, she could ever ask for, and then like people like Kimberly Jones or um, Tia Williams or um, Nicola Mitchell. Mm-hmm. My daughter has been in the room with so many living legends. Mm-hmm. She has seen so many powerful, strong black mm-hmm. women. Even myself, and she can she see me pay all the bills by myself. Right? But yet, you have to find your work by your by yourself, and I ain't helping you out. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm the enemy in your story. So I took that idea. And I put it in my podcast because I wanted people to see. I ain't hide from it because that is that's her experience. That's what that's her truth. So I didn't come back and be like, "You lying? That's not true." That's her truth. I may not agree with it. And it hurts. Oh yeah, because I still got stress marks from from birthing her. I almost lost my life from birthing her. And 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 when things were going on with my marriage and the family, I protected her from everything that was going on. You you didn't even know. You didn't know your dad. When you was visiting your dad, you thought he was at camp. I lied. I was playing these these games so that y'all could still love him. And yeah, I was upset. Very, very bitter. And so this is why I played that that audio in my podcast. And then I talked about it. Because I want people to see. This is life. Yes. This is what happens. These things happen. It, they're ugly, they're beautiful, they're different, and this is mine. And I'm dealing with it. And this is how I'm dealing with it. So, and I'm still dealing with it. You know, we've got a lot better though now. Like my daughter's about to be 20 now. And I think I'm going to have her on season three um, of the podcast so we can talk about her part. Because now you're a grown woman. So now we've got to have some conversations. And you're going to also take accountability in some of the things that you were doing. Because I can go into a whole other realm for, like, she took on her dad's mentality then. I'm like, okay, now it's my turn to mess with mom. Now it's my turn to lie up. Now it's my turn to do so. I was just, it was a lot, y'all. And not to say that I'm perfect and stuff, but it's So, how do you take something that's like a kind of like a vessel for healing, but it's also still like a podcast kind of way to still want to perform well, help you to just continue to build everything you're building? How do you take something that is healing, like something for healing, and still push it and grow it and stay consistent with it, even though you may need to like take time to sit with some of these things? Honestly, I think about the outcome of what happens when I. Because honestly, I'm my biggest supporter. I'm my biggest investor. Um, I'm a, my biggest com- confidant. I confidant. I confide in myself. I encourage myself. I mean, I root for myself. And so it's um, I've been tapping into my self love now for like the past ever since I kicked my daughter out. And I'll talk about that on my podcast. Mm-hmm. I had to like I had to say, I had to cut some ties because I had to be like I had to be okay. Mm-hmm. She was old enough now. Cool. And I'm gonna uh, let me do this, and then let me, and then I need to save my son too. That's a whole other story too. So I began to really focus on me for the past.
past four years just pouring into me, mm-hmm. crying, um, laying, you know, laying and staying there. Yeah. Sometimes I just lay down, I just lay there. I ain't get up. I allow myself to feel it. <laughs> and honestly, and then I thought about what happens if I don't push this content. I thought about what happens if I quit. I don't know if y'all too much, and I'm like, I don't want to do this no more. Y'all was getting on my nerves. I'm like, Pete, not y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just a lot of it was. It's a lot of people. Like when when you're doing this, people have an expectation, yeah, and everyone wants to talk to you directly. It's a lot, y'all. And so that's what I'm saying. I'm crazy because who does this? Who signs up for these things? Right. Me. Yeah. And I'm able to kind of deal with it, right? Think he does it too. And I'm able to do it because I see the bigger picture it's not about me. And I think about all the outcomes, what happens when y'all get in this room and y'all make those connections. Mm-hmm. Or you listen to somebody in the panel and you're inspired. Mm-hmm. Someone earlier today, I ain't talked to this lady in 10 years. It was a brand I, I launched over a decade ago. And she wrote articles for me for this for this website. I ain't talked to this lady in 10 years. She took those articles and she made a whole book out of them. And she showed up to my event today and she said, I want to thank you. And I'm like, well, what, what, what are you? And she used to write me over that. And I've had a lot of stories like that. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll keep going. That's what I be saying in our mind. Okay, I'm going to keep going because there are people that are benefiting from me just doing something. So it's not really for me, it's for y'all. And that's honestly what keeps me going because if I stop, those type of stories will stop too. So I guess I'm kind of sacrificing myself. But you know, God, he, he, he has blessed me in this past year. You know, he's been holding me down and guiding me, mainly because I have began to turn back to him. Again, I had to go through the wilderness of being upset and being bitter and being mad and, and cussing him out and all this BS. And I was, I was mad. Like, he, was, he was dealing me a lot of cards. It wasn't fun. And so now I'm getting to the point of where I'm back to that, that PK kid. I'm going back to my roots. And I understand my purpose. I'm not mad about my purpose anymore. And I'm just going with the flow. I appreciate that. Thank you. And you know what, Walt? Now, let me just highlight Walt. Walt is one of the few people on this planet that when he met me from jump, he was like, what I need to do? Oh, okay, I'm going to do this today. You bring shit to me that I don't even have to ask. And I always tell you that I appreciate you, but I really do, Walt, because there are not a lot of people that give me resources, connect the dots with people, like people like great, like good people. And I know that if you're bringing them to me, they are a reflection of you, because you are a good fucking person. Mm-hmm. And I think you know that. Writers 
and, and how to also, you know, make sure that we're not wasting time with Bubba and his, you know, baby mamas and all that stuff. And um, also about healing. Um, I met other people over the weekend. Um, I, I met this woman named Ursula. We went chopping it up outside. Oh, wait, you're coming in here. I met uh, a, a couple, they, they left, but one of them's an educator, and the, the wife has a publication company, and you know, so, and, you know, I've met other people, you know, just inadvertently, so it's just been great. This is my first time. My name is Shirley Jones Luke, I'm from Boston. What's your name? Yeah, go ahead. I'm Tony. Tony? Yeah. Oh, it's your first time? Yes. That's the song. I'm Anthony Cordova, Tony C. The man about love. You know. Feel it. Well, welcome, welcome. That's what I love about just like intentional communities, like I was saying before, like all the people we're meeting, like they're here for something, and not just to take, but also give as well. I met, I don't even remember people's names, I'm bad with names, but I just I remember all the energy that they were seeing. Yeah, I remember the face, I remember the face. Um, now, earlier you were talking about this podcast being a way for you to heal, but then also appreciate yourself, a lot of self love. Mm-hmm. And early when we were speaking, you were talking about self love languages. Yeah. Now, I, um, I'm late to the game. I've been learning about love languages this past year, and um, it's just really powerful to really know how you can communicate with others. Like, how many of y'all are familiar with like love languages? All right, cool. Can one of y'all call one of them out? Time. Time. Provide. Want to provide. Is it So, can you talk a little bit about like the self love languages? Because that's a term I haven't heard of. Oh, for real. Okay. For real, you ain't heard it? I've never heard of it. All that. Okay. Okay. So I just applied it and just put self in front of love because as I've gotten older, I didn't get a chance to really learn Tamika as an individual. I became a mom really young. And then before that, my mom was, you know, sick. And so I was working young. And I was helping around the house. I grew up, I was just responsible. And then before that, I was a PK kid almost in church five days out of the week. So being like a kid kid was just not, you know, like the norm, not the thing. And then I didn't really connect with other children my age because, again, I'm a PK kid. So I don't, I didn't even listen to secular music, which is a little, like, rap and army and all that other stuff. I didn't say when I was, like, 12. 12, 13 years old, going into my teen years. So as I've gotten older and, and, and when I realized my experience with my children was not what I thought it was going to be, then when I realized that my experience in my marriage was not what I had hoped it to be, and then when I started really just getting to know people and how people can be me, liars, like just the ugly parts of it, um, I began to realize, wait a minute, I gotta pull back a little bit. Because what am I looking for? What am I seeking? Because having love for your children, that's great, that's beautiful, that's supposed to come automatically. But I wasn't receiving it automatically. I was something I had to work for. I felt like I was on mission for it. So I thought, okay, well what how can I be okay when it's just me in the room? So when I had to start really processing that question, I had to start thinking about those love languages and applying it to me and nobody else around. Like, I'm going to give myself the affirmations I need. I'm going to give quality time to me. I'm going to give myself gifts. What's the other ones? All the other ones. I'm going to give myself. Right. Acts of service. I'm going to give, like, I took myself to Greece this past summer. You know, I have a cheat down and stuff. Like, I was having fun. Like, just doing stuff for me. And so that's where I started talking about self-love languages. Because we have to start loving ourselves first. We have to start pouring into ourselves first and identifying the things that we need before we can actually connect and make friendships with other people. Phoebe, the hotline, bring love. Like, there's a lot of things that we've been told. There's a lot of mantras we have for ourselves. Well, let's take one in particular that really is like it's. Um, I think it's, it's, it was the act of me talking to myself and talking through it. Because again, if no one is else around, and these are the things I need to hear, then I have to say it. So telling myself it's okay. When I didn't want to get up, talking myself to get up and get through my day. When I was frustrated, I wanted to quit. Talking to myself to find solutions. You know, just talking myself through that through that process. That's like that's the main act that I adapted 
um, that I felt like is the strongest love language that you can ever tell. And it almost kind of goes back to my church days, um, uh, manifesting things and speaking things over your life. Like I learned that even in church. Like your words have power. When you say these things, they have feelings and emotions behind them. So this is why I say I'm shit man. This is why I say I, you know, go do this. Or um, or you, you know, go do that. Give myself all these these things that I feel like someone else should have given me. I give it to myself. Now that is the number one thing. It all starts with your words and your mindset. And I have to get those things together. Almost like tricking yourself before all those other things. Could align with what I wanted. I'm waiting for my husband now, so I am single. So y'all yeah, know. You know what I'm saying? 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 Yes. And I'm serious. This, this is the first time I'm serious in my life, y'all, so I'm ready. I can't believe I'm going to show like a date dating to each other. Oh, no. Yeah. Who's going to be cheating to me? Hmm. I'm going to be cheating to me. All right, we'll take a ball on the bridge. He's going to leave. We'll have okay. all the cast in. Okay.
we're running close on time, but I do want to have like one or two questions. Um, anyone have just a question? Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. Yes. I'm ready. Thank you for putting on a Black Friday weekend, and um, I'm glad um, I, I had a question based on something you had mentioned earlier about you know putting all your stuff out out there, all your you know your personals. Um, do you fear like? backlash or anything like that? Did you ever fear backlash when you put yourself out there, like really out there for people to know all the ins and outs of you? Like, you know, because I'm one of the reasons, because you're that, someone that, you, you, you had asked earlier about how many really put themselves out there and are honest. And I, you know, and I was like, I, I can't because I, you know, feel that someone will bring up, well, you said in this book, or you said on an interview, da da da, be, you know, throw something back in your face, or getting back to my kids. I'm a mom of four, and my youngest is nine, my oldest is 19. Um, so it's like, you know, I don't want somebody to come up to that with your mom, you know, she's the yes, I chick, and da 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 you know. Yes, I was, but you know, that's all I did. what you're saying though in short form no I'm, I'm absolutely I have no fear I, I don't regret or have any type of negative feeling about the content I put out there because I'm not lying I'm not embellishing either I'm just talking I'm just telling the truth about my experiences and people that um that are part of those experiences and they don't like what I'm saying my response is well you should have hated them you should have did something differently probably should have did that you don't want me talking about it, that means it probably should have not been done. So how I feel about the things I have revealed and said, and my, and then my thing about this is when it comes to my children, I begin to allow them to see me be human. When they were around, my daughter was probably about 12, 12, 13. But when I got tired of putting on that, you know, that, that makeup and that wall to protect them, I began to allow them to see me be human. So that my children grow up and be, oh, my mom, she was a strong black woman. She made it work. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that strong black woman that had to carry things, carry everything on her back, and carry all those burdens, and no one helped me. And I had to get all, you know, pay all my bills. Like, that is not something to be proud of. That is great that we're able to do it. But black women, ain't we tired? We should not have to carry be have to carry everything. I talk to them, to them about the truth. And even now when they talk about their dads, I don't, I, and, and my sister and all this stuff that happened, I don't share the code, nothing. And I talk about even things that I did. And, and I apologize, and I own up for my part in their sadness, my part in, in their family breaking up and, and all that. I, I've talked about it with them. So I was, and my, this is my encouragement for anyone that is fearful of being completely honest and vulnerable about how they want to express themselves. Process what you're afraid of. What they gonna say? Okay, if they say something, then say what? Why you stops? Your bills not gonna get paid? I mean, I mean, you can't go to sleep at night? Like, what, 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 like, what is the alternative? Like, I'm trying to, like, when we really process that, like, what's gonna happen? You don't get a whoop it? <laughs> You know what's in the corner? Like, <laughs> <laughs> we all afraid of. Ain't nobody stopping me. But, you know what's stopping me? Like, I can do what I want to do. I'm a grown woman. I can talk about my experiences. I can own my experiences. And I can, you know, and I can, it's, it's mine. It's mine to talk about. So, if, you, if you're feeling like that and you're a little stuck on being really authentic in your creativity, just focus on why. And then I want you to focus on, okay, if you really did it the way that you wanted to do, and people begin to say stuff that you did not like or made her to feel like whoever did to you, then do what? Because they said something, you're going to stop? Because they didn't like it, you're not going to continue to create? At the end of the day, it's on you. People say and do things so you will stop. People will say, well, you think you all that. No, you think I'm all that. Right. Oh, you think you're too good for us? No, you 
I'm too good. You can't speak for me. Now, granted, yes, I am too good. I am. I am. All of that in a bag of Rios is spicy. But again, you have to own it and really be authentic and true within your own purpose and your own existence. And all this shit will fall to the side. You won't even care. I don't. I say it all the time. I don't care. I'm going to ask you to go on a t-shirt. I care. Like, without the eat. If you have any, if not, that's cool as well because this is the last session. But what's happening? At oh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, if y'all can join us at Meow's, we're gonna go to the rooftop. We're gonna mix, mingle, eat, drink, network, all that beautiful stuff until about nine o'clock. Um, you don't have to stay till now, but I hope that you do. And uh, and then tomorrow we are gonna be celebrating Tara McMillan at Frame 82 Girls. It starts at 5 30. I know the website says three, it's like we get shaky and all that jazz. But 5.30, if you show up, um, for the mixer and all that jazz, um, and show up and look and look in fierce. Like, come in your, your gowns and your dresses and have your makeup on and your hair done up, because this is our brand day. This is when we celebrate us. So I want to get thank you all. Make sure y'all, you know, um, follow us on social media. Utilize our hashtag Black Writers Weekend. Tell somebody about it. Not just this weekend, but continue to have that conversation about what we're doing. Um, because again, the work that I do, it is really to benefit everybody. Um, and I really want this to grow. Um, I really want this to be a blessing to um, a lot, a lot of people. But that only happens if you guys also.